Magic Conj, will I ever get to meet Tom Kenny? Maybe someday. Oh, so you're saying there's a chance. Okay, okay. Should I tell fans of the show how they can support us? Yes. Goofy Goobers, supporting the show is shockingly easier than catching a blue jellyfish. Right from our Anchor page, anchor.fm slash spongepod, you can find links to all of our social media and a support button if you happen to have a few extra clams. Also follow us on twitch.tv slash spongebobpodcast, where it's not only the official home to our sister show, Video Bob Game Pants, it's also where I stream live drawings of various Nickelodeon characters and host the opportunity for commissions and giveaways. Lastly, the official merchandise store is now open at redbubble.com slash people slash spongepod, where various designs will be uploaded in Inspired by our show, including our official logo, which is now available on a multitude of products like t-shirts, stickers, duvet covers, and even a shower curtain. This is a podcast by a fan for fans and will always be fan driven. Any way you see fit on supporting our show is much appreciated. Thank you and enjoy. Ahoy, mateys, and welcome to another episode of I'm Ready, a SpongePod Squarecast. My name is Captain Eric, and we are continuing our sail through the first season of SpongeBob SquarePants. I don't have an interview this week for the SpongeBob SquarePants movie rehydrated collab, but please pay attention to next week's episode. Get ready. We're going to have a big group on. Uh, we're going to have a wonderful conversation about everything with SpongeBob and the collab itself, and we'll see how that conversation goes. Um, but yeah, this week... It's just myself. It's just classic sailing with the captain. Um, but man, I, I have something I have to talk about. Like, I know that this is a SpongeBob podcast. I, I talk a little bit about Nicktoons and other animation. And what I'm going to talk about today is is further away from uh, animation and from SpongeBob. And I apologize for anyone who hears this and goes like, ah, this is this is not what I pressed play for. But this is my only podcast right now. I used to juggle about two podcasts um for about seven years and those were at least doorways for me to talk about other things I'm into or something that bothers me or something I like and I don't have those outlets anymore and I just need to like get this off my chest I have, I have just pure frustration and I'm, I'm frustrated in both ways of this situation so other than Spongebob one of my other loves in this world is professional wrestling I like pro wrestling I love pro wrestling loved it as a kid stopped watching it as a teenager and got back into it when I was in college and as an adult you can enjoy wrestling from a dip, different perspective professional wrestling in this country is by far one of the most underappreciated and disrespected art forms we have people just scoff at it and they just have to remind you that like you know it's fake i'm i'm almost 30 years old and i still have people who when they find out like you watch wwe yeah you know it's fake right and i'm like dude you you just went and watched uh, what movie in theaters? You watched Avengers Endgame. You knew that was fake, right? But you were still able to enjoy it. And now you want to engage in a 40 minute conversation about superheroes. And you're going to get down on me because I watch professional wrestling. Uh, uh, talk to the hand. I don't want to speak to you. Um, why does that still happen? I don't know. I, I don't know why this, this group of people just can't like get past that. People know it's fixed, but they're still, there's still something really good there when it is good. And trust me, not all of it is good. There's a lot of it that is terrible. But when it's good, professional wrestling is is some of the best entertainment you can find. And that's not even on a weekly basis. I'm talking about like one or two or maybe three times a year. There's something going on that's worth showing people who are not into professional wrestling. But I'm actually not going to talk about the wrestling itself. I'm actually going to talk about the video games. Um, so for anyone that knows, they know exactly where I'm going with this. And if you don't know, I'm just going to give you a very quick education so that you can join me in understanding this frustration. Um, the primary, de the primary developer for WWE games was, uh, was Uke's I think they're just called Uke's Company, Uke's uh, Entertainment, Uke's Future Creations, Y-U-K-E-S, Uke's. They have been um, making WWE games all the way back to when they were called WWF in the year 2000. They started with WWF SmackDown and have almost made yearly titles for the WWE. And at some point when 
Um, they stopped making, you know, uh, console specific games like during the GameCube, PS2 and Xbox era. PS2 had SmackDown, Xbox had Raw, and GameCube had WrestleMania. Once they stopped all that and started saying, okay, let's just make one game and it's going to be through all the, you know, each console will have it, and they started really making the yearly titles, was, uh, I believe, with SmackDown versus Raw, uh, 2006 is when they started doing the yearly stuff. 2007, I believe, was the first time it went to multiple consoles, the same game. And since then... They've been consistent with it. And even though there's been different name changes, it used to be WWE SmackDown vs. Raw 2007, 2008, 2009, 2010. Then for two years, they just went to WWE 12 and then 13. And then 2K took over after THQ uh, went under. And now 2K, as a... As a uh, they're not developing the game. 2K is basically just helping to release it. Hey, it's under our branding. It's under our umbrella. We'll release it as WWE 2K14, 2K15. We'll make it a yearly thing. So Ukes as a company is now releasing, developing a wrestling game every single year. And I'm going to give them a little bit of flack because I feel like even though you would think just a year turnover time, there isn't a lot that can be done. I felt that from 2K14 all the way up to 2K19, there wasn't enough leaps and bounds of what you could have done. The, I, I just, I'm not a game developer, and I do not want to act as if I know, but it just feels like once you develop the arena and the ring, there's no need to go back in and really tweak that. Like, of course, with the with better graphics and lighting, you want to update those kind of graphics. But it feels like at some point the workload should get easier year after year. And with that easiness of stuff that you don't have to remodel, for example, somebody like um, Andre the Giant. If you're going to model Andre the Giant, there's no need to really touch that model year after year unless you mess it up. And you just have to touch it up. But once it's perfect, I, you shouldn't touch that. And I've seen cases between year after year where even somebody like The Rock, Dwayne Johnson, looks perfect one year and a year or two later looks completely different. Like, why are you wasting time remodeling somebody you don't need to remodel? So I, I think after a while, 2K just got sick of Ukes not really pushing the series forward and still like this struggling that they've hit this glass ceiling, if you will, and they dropped them. So 2K20 comes out with the first time with Ukes without developing it. And it, of course, is an awful mess. It is an unplayable mess almost day one. And I think even up to this point, 2K announced that they were going to keep the servers open for 2K19 because 20 was such a disaster. And it was such a disaster that there's actually not even this year a 2K21 because there's no way they could have taken the mess of last year and even tried to attempt something this year. It wasn't going to happen. They had to take a break. So this year, 2K released WWE 2K Battlegrounds, which is a very cartoony um, uh, like arcade type brawling game, and I just start, I just started playing it, and it's enjoyable, but it's just still, it's just upsetting. It's upsetting to play because one of my favorite wrestling games of all time is actually a spinoff title. It's a game called WWE All Stars. It was released uh, a few years ago for the 360 and PS3 and the Wii. And it, it was a super over-the-top arcade-style wrestling game. The wrestlers were, like, massive. Like, their heads were big and their muscles were big. It was clearly cartoony. And I remember at the time people trashing it because they were like, this looks really weird. Why, does, why do they look so weird? Why are they jumping up in the air so high? And I'm going, like, you don't remember, like, NFL Blitz or NFL Street where you could actually have fun with sports games and make them, you know, like a video game and not everything has to be a simulation? But I guess not. I guess I'm in the minority in that one. Um, but it was so simple, and it was fun, and I enjoyed it. I loved it. I had the fight stick for it. I was playing online. I was undefeated, and I'm still undefeated. And if anyone out there thinks they can beat me in WWE All-Stars, step up to the plate. I will challenge you. But... um. 
yeah all so here we have this like other attempt at a cartoony brawler and it's a weird you know it's not arcade enough but it's trying to be a stimulation at the same time in a, in a few ways i don't know i for anybody out there on the fence if there happens to be any wrestling fans uh i would say get it it's a cheap title but don't expect a lot i and that that's what got me i like right before recording this i got to finally play a few matches in that game and it was like okay this is fun but what else what else do we have here and I felt bad because I never felt that way while playing all-stars like even though it was easy to pick up easy to learn easy to play it was always fun and I just am not seeing the fun here and I think that's what frustrates me given especially what happened last year and that 2k is really just messing up wrestling games I mean, look, getting rid of the developer, sure, by all means, you want to get rid of them, they're not doing a good enough job, I, I, fine, but I, I don't know. I feel like there's just, there's other methods, and I, I don't think wrestling is, is a fit for 2K right now, and I don't think they should be, it should be under their umbrella. I think some other company needs to pick up WWE as a series and, and actually have fun with these things, and not have to remodel legends every year for no reason or maybe there is like i said i'm not a game developer I, maybe there's something i'm missing but i just feel like there's some obvious things that as a fan playing these games year after year i can go why why are you doing this why are you making this decision and not this decision and um man i can go on another 20 minute rant about how they handle the uh, online there, but I'm not going to because it's now almost been 12 minutes. So um, we're going to move on to some SpongeBob news. Uh, for anybody that saw it, um, CBS All Access is now going to be called Paramount Plus. Uh, and for those that don't know, CBS All Access is going to be, was going to be the home for uh, the SpongeBob movie Sponge on the Run, which is now going to be a launch title for Paramount Plus, which I, I think. That's their plan is when they finally launch Paramount Plus or the rebranded CBS All Access. SpongeBob will be a part of there. That was their plan uh, when they first announced the SpongeBob movie coming to CBS All Access, that there was going to be this big rebranding. Uh, and, and day one of that rebranding, SpongeBob would be on there along with every season of the show. Now, along with SpongeBob, if they happen to... Um, Viacom owns Nickelodeon. They have an entire decades worth of library of shows. There should be no reason that on day one of Paramount Plus, every single Nickelodeon show is on there, except for I don't know how their um, their deals with Netflix are, you know, because Avatar and Korra are on there. Um, but if if not, most of these shows should be available on Paramount Plus to me. That's a day one purchase. I, I've invested already in Disney Plus. Um, I have Hulu because of my my uh, Sprint phone plan, so I have that for free. I have no problem pay paying for Paramount Plus if they're going to go the full nine yards and be like, "This is this is our content dump. This is everything we own. Boom, every MTV show. Boom, every Nickelodeon show. Boom, throw it on there." Um, I would love to see that because I right now, if you wanted to get Nickelodeon, like classic Nicktoon shows and whatnot, they're very splintered in where you can find them. There's some available on the Verve, which has their own Nick Splat uh, section, which for me was way too expensive for how little they offered. I think they were asking for like ten dollars a month um, and there just weren't there were a good handful of shows but it just wasn't a lot for the money um there's amazon's nick hits i think is also ten dollars a month and i think you get more shows but you're also missing some key moments like they'll have the first two seasons of ren and stimpy and then they're missing the other two there's that and then there's a bunch of nickelodeon shows on hulu like full seasons of rugrat full i think the full series of rugrats and danny phantom and uh and hey arnold so that's cool and everything, but why can't all of these shows be under one umbrella that I'd be happy to pay for? Um, I So if all the Nickelodeon shows, the live action stuff, Keenan and Kel, The Adventures of Pete and Pete, all the Nicktoons, everything newer, if it's all going to be on Paramount+, Plus, I say that's a day one purchase for me, and I think anybody who uh, enjoys the Nicktoons stuff out there, I think you would agree with me on that. Um, 
So we'll, we'll keep an eye out and see just how, how much of a deal Paramount Plus is, but I definitely wanted to mention that. This week's episode is called Suds. This is a season one episode in which SpongeBob gets sick. Um, and for anybody who's gotten sick, I mean, I have quoted so many parts of this show, this episode. Uh, anytime I get sick, I used to mention to people like, I don't want to go to the doctor and read old magazines. And, and we've all been there. We've all been sick. And this is something this is a kind of episode that really anybody could enjoy. Like if you have somebody who doesn't enjoy SpongeBob, I think this is an episode you could show them because it's it's somewhat relatable. We've been sick. We don't want to go to the doctor. And you always have people around you telling you different things on what to do. Oh, try this remedy. Oh, you should do this. You shouldn't do that. So th this is one of just those prime season one episodes. I think this would make my top ten. I don't think it would make my top five. And if it did, it would be number five. Um, but I, am, I, I keep mentioning where I think these episodes would land. So I certainly, uh, once I'm done with season one... I'm going to have a uh, I'm going to do a YouTube episode of a ranking system and try to try to uh, just a, a YouTube uh, video ranking my season one episodes in order from from best to I don't want to say worst because the my least favorite season one episode is probably still really good, but it will be a list from my. Uh, from my absolute favorite season one episode to my least favorite season one episode. Um, and I, I think Suds would make the top 10. I'm going to say that right now. Um, so we're going to take a quick ad break. And when we come back, we will watch the episode Suds together. 2,000 years later. All right, and we're back. Thank you. Uh, thank you for anybody who sits through those ads just because they don't want to have to fast forward on whatever device they're listening to or whatever service you're listening to the show from. Uh, th those ads help very slightly, and hopefully one day I can do this show um, exclusively and be a content creator and not have to uh, be upset and go to work every day. But, hey, whatever helps, right? Uh, so uh, the episode we have today, Suds, it is the second part of the 15th episode of SpongeBob SquarePants. It first debuted January 17th, the year 2000. Um, I think it's, I, I think I was reading that this is actually the last episode to use the 1999 copyright date in the credits. Um, so I, I and uh, like we said uh, in previous episodes, I think there might have been a, a scheduling thing where they were scheduling episodes a little bit later to coincide with with different events going on. So uh, for season one, I think this just just got pushed over into January, which isn't bad anyway. So um, but yeah, that that's very interesting that I think this is the last one with the uh, with the 1999 credits uh, with the copyright date. Um, so who do we have here? We have Paul, uh, written by Ta Paul Tibbet, Enio Torreson Jr., and Mr. Lawrence himself, Doug Lawrence. That didn't make any sense, and I'm keeping that in. I'm not editing that out. <laughs> uh, I always see Doug Lawrence, and I'm like, he goes by Mr. Lawrence, so I don't know, I don't know who to, what to call him as. Um, we get a, a nice little cameo in this episode by Tom Kenny, and of course we'll get to that moment. It's one of my favorite jokes uh, that they've used in the show, um, which, which is the whole uh, the sponge treatment. I, I love that scene, and we'll get to that in a, in a second. Um, for anybody who wants to follow along with me, you can have your, your episode at hand. I'm going to be watching it from, as usual, Amazon Prime for as long as they're going to be on there. Uh, I'm sure in the next year that may change. We might be watching this off of Paramount+. Plus. And hopefully, man, if I'm all this mentioning of Paramount+, Plus, hopefully I can convince them to advertise on this show. I would do that in a heartbeat. Paramount, you know where to get, a, you know where to get in touch with me. Um, but yeah, have your episode up. Of course, we are not going to be, uh, there is no theme song in the beginning of this episode. It is literally just the, uh, the title card. So we're going to be watching that at the beginning of the title card. Um, along, you can press play now. Um, it's one, I, I will say this for as uncertain as I am on where this might be in my, uh, my top list. Uh, the title card here, I love, it's just, uh, I like in the in the first season when they would have those kind of out there title cards. Um, so I really enjoy the uh, the bubble looking of the Suds title card. Um, 
and and this is weird that right along with with sleepy time uh we get like another spongebob dream it's really cool i don't know if that was planned that those two would be so close together that they would just oh spongebob is having a dream of krabby patties falling out of the sky and then he's eating his pillow um I, I I've always found that interesting with these two with these two episodes right next to each other. Uh, of course, Gary is sleeping. I, I love the idea that SpongeBob is wearing his shoes in bed and you know then is able to tiptoe like that with him. Uh, his inside of his house is just so uh, incredible. I'm sure would work, but it's certainly an interesting design uh, of his home. I wonder if you were trying to kind of rebuild that how how you would actually be able to get the look down on the outside but still functionally have the inside look the same. Um, there's got to be somebody out there who has tried to map out SpongeBob's house. It's one of the most famous homes in cartoons. Um, so the whole point of this episode is that during the middle of the night, SpongeBob uh, is hungry, falls asleep while eating, but he left the fridge open, which then causes uh, the entire house to freeze over, seemingly. And um, and then, of course, he gets a cold now for for anybody who is not, you know, into medical stuff or knows anything about uh, sicknesses there. There isn't really um, getting freezing cold isn't it's a misconception that you're going to get sick from that. Um, you get sick from germs, uh, but the only thing that you're going to really get by being in severe uh, temperature like that is the possibility of hypothermia. Um, so now SpongeBob being a fictional character and being a sponge and there's there's the fact that there is a sponge treatment. Our real life science and physics don't really kind of mesh. So it's kind of one of those OK things. And I absolutely love the bubble joke in the underwear kind of making uh, making it look like SpongeBob's got a, a big butt. And it's usually that I've seen that used in memes where they're like, yeah, I totally watch SpongeBob for the uh, for the stories. You know, there's nothing else. There's no other reasons why I'm watching SpongeBob. Um uh, and just everything about the show, everything visually about SpongeBob, it makes you really feel bad for him. Um, he, everything he's going through. I, I hate seeing SpongeBob sick, and I just, even growing up when I saw this, you you just feel terrible. They make him look absolutely obviously sick. And honestly, as a as a worker myself, I've pretty much have gone the SpongeBob route that I really don't like calling out of work unless I absolutely cannot work like at all. I have to be on SpongeBob level of sick for me to actually call out of work. Um, I do apologize if there might be a sync issue with your episode. If you are listening along um, they, they, for some reason, my, uh, my Mac today is just having problems with me recording and watching at the same time. Never had problems on this level, but for some reason today, maybe, it, it, hey, you know what? My Mac is sticking with the theme of of sickness. It's just being sick right now. It's acting sick. Um, SpongeBob's eye crawling off, of, like crawling down on his body. Um, so it, we, we've all been in this situation. We've all been so sick that we just have to, we have to, of course, for anybody out there who are young, you go right to your parents when you're older and you just don't know what's going on. You might call your friends to be like, uh, yeah, this and this is happening, although possibly not as prevalent in the 90s. Uh, in 2020, if we get sick and we don't know what's going on, we're probably going to go to Google uh, right before calling our friends. That might be a thing. Um, this is for uh, I also read a piece of trivia about this episode that I guess this is the shortest time we've seen SpongeBob at the Krusty Krab. I don't know if that's for the full series or just the season but yeah apparently for the scene that spongebob is at the crusty crab for that time it is the shortest amount that he's ever in the crusty crab i believe that i can't think of anything at the top of my head that would disprove that um but yeah so we have patrick apparently has such a fear of the doctor has now there's a lot to unpack here. First off, it seems like SpongeBob may have never have 
gone to the doctor on his own, or at least being, you know, on his own from his parents as a kind of an adult. Patrick seems to have been to the doctor and had such a traumatic experience that he's actively telling SpongeBob not to go. And due to his complaints, it's like they they make you they make you read old magazines, which as far as I know, anytime I'm in a doctor's office, they have some pretty up to date magazines, although I probably have been in some that have had some older ones. Um, but then Patrick with his stethoscope, you know, oh, my God, the stethoscope is so cold. And when it touches your skin, psh, we've all I mean, yeah, that that part is not never pleasant, but. I wouldn't say that that's so bad. I would tell somebody not to go to the doctor. Uh, in, in fact, I would come up with like five other reasons for somebody not to go to the doctor at, at the point in my life that I was afraid to go. Uh, but right now I, I would be more afraid of somebody being afraid of the doctor and like being around them to get sick. Clearly this kind of sickness, although it's kind of, you know, there's no such thing as suds. Um, it's, it's, kind of modeled after the flu a little bit or a cold um and i just don't know obviously suds seems to be a sponge specific thing so i don't think uh, patrick or sandy are gonna get the suds uh but we have patrick uh impersonating a doctor which when sandy calls him out on that in this episode like she's absolutely right impersonating a doctor is an absolute crime don't ever do that uh, don't pers- impersonate a doctor. Even, I believe, even sending an email pretending to be a doctor uh, is is a crime. I think you can you can uh, face charges for that if you do something like that. Um, that line, anytime I've put gloves on in this world, this is how SpongeBob has bled into my life to such a level. If I... Anytime I've had to put on rubber gloves, the first thing, even if I don't say it, I'm thinking it. I'm putting my hands up like Patrick and I'm going, don't touch me. I'm sterile. If I don't say it, just know I am thinking it a hundred percent of the time. Um, So we have Patrick trying all these weird methods, which, of course, we know he's not a doctor. It's just weird. Like here we have like the, the medieval stuff. I don't know where his thought process was of like, ah, we can get rid of suds by plugging up your holes and putting peanut butter on your feet and and then putting bread in your shoe. Um, I, I, I do love the the banter here between Sandy and, and Patrick. I, I love him pretending to be at a, a voicemail. And <laughs> since when is your house had feet? This is my mobile home. Like, Little jokes like that are really funny, and and that's the stuff I really enjoy about the, these early episodes. Just the kind of um, blink and you miss it visual uh, gags, the the very quick wit nature of the jokes. Um, it's certainly far different than the way we're getting SpongeBob comedy now. Which, depending on what kind of comedy you like, comedy is subjective. Uh, it could be better, could be worse. For me, this kind of very slow, methodical, visual, and and small jokes is what really gets me and sits with me. Because it's those moments that it doesn't have to be laugh out loud. When, when Patrick says, don't touch me, I'm sterile. It's not a moment that you're busting a gut laughing, but it's just a moment that is so... It happens, and you see it enough as a kid, and it sticks with you. So it doesn't have to be super funny for it to just be incredibly memorable. Uh, A lot about this episode is incredibly memorable. Um, Of of course, SpongeBob just filling up with these bubbles. um, It's kind of it's kind of weird that his body is just is growing. And you think uh, Patrick must have gotten some really good corks to keep all of those in. Um, Because I, I think with the amount of pressure that seems to be building up inside of him, that those corks would would absolutely explode off and and poor Mr. Krabs here he let SpongeBob go home like he let the guy go home because he knew he was sick he was being a good boss and then you know this has to happen to him I I feel bad for Mr. Krabs in this situation because certainly in the first season he's a lot less greedy as he eventually would become but he he didn't really deserve to have the the crusty crab 
uh, destroyed. Um, apparently, this is the first episode where the Krusty Krab appears without Squidward. That's another interesting tidbit here. Um, and and just a lot of weird, uh, <laughs> weird like one-off trivia, trivia about this episode. Here's our first appearance of Hans. Oh, Hans here, and here we have. Uh, th- this is. I don't know where Sud sits on my top of the ep- episodes, but this right here, there's Mr. Tom Kenny right there in the shower being scrubbed with a uh, with a yellow sponge. Good for him. Um, but yeah, this is like I said, I don't know where Sud sits in my top episodes, but those kind of live action scenes are always going to be higher up on my list than anything else. Here's your lollipop. Uh, which, of course, we all know as kids, we go to the the doctor, they give us some goodies, we go to the dentist, we go to, um, you know, they'll usually give you like a cool toothbrush or they'll give you cute little knickknacks and little toys here and there. Uh, this, but this is kind of mean, too, for for the doctor, unless he was told by Sandy, like, here's SpongeBob, who is sick, and here's Patrick, who is holding him from being here not letting him come and he was impersonating a doctor and then the doctor getting upset about that and saying, okay, you know, I'll mess with him. Um, but Patrick was clearly traumatized from the doctor enough to keep SpongeBob away. And their, their goal is like, yeah, let's do something really bad to Patrick. Like he's going to not want to come back to the doctor. Uh, (laughs) Oh yes. We've got a special treatment for you. We're going to rub you on a cactus. Uh, that's not going to help Patrick's trauma, and he certainly deserved somewhat of a comeuppance to, from keeping SpongeBob away for so long. But uh, as much as I love that ending, growing up, I'm like looking, you know, taking a step back and realizing, like, ah, that was a, uh, it's not really, it doesn't really solve the overarching problem here of Patrick's fear of the doctors, uh, other than he wanted a, a a big lollipop as well, and hopefully he gets one at the end. That's all I can hope is if you're going to if you're going to rub the guy in the cactus, can you at least get him a lollipop at the end? And hopefully that makes him feel better. Maybe that's what was traumatizing the first time. Maybe (laughs) he uh, didn't get a lollipop and then he just got really upset. Maybe they gave their last one to to a kid right in front of him or to someone else. And uh, Patrick went was sick, went through all these treatments or whatever, had to read old magazines, had to have the stethoscope. And then he was like, hey, at least I get that lollipop. And then they didn't give it to him. Then he's like. Well, I don't want to go to the doctor anymore. That guy lies. Uh, But that was Suds. Bar none, one of the best episodes of the first season. Like I said earlier, it's an episode I feel like you could show a non-SpongeBob fan. And because we've all been sick, and I like to think that 99% of the people who listen to this have all been to the doctor at least a few times in their life, so they know those moments of being in the waiting room and the stethoscope and the the stuff that happens almost every time you go, uh, that is is relatable. So you could show somebody who doesn't like SpongeBob and they can find the the uh, the something relatable there and then pack in the jokes and the humor. And I, I think this is a good episode to, to show people. Um, but that was Suds. Oh, man, what 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 else to say about it? I absolutely I love some of the visual gags in this episode. And, and as I mentioned, there are a, a lot of lines in this in this episode that uh, creep into my daily lexicon in a way that almost no other episode in season one has. And they're very specific. If I ever am handing somebody a lollipop, I'm going to say, here's your lollipop. Um, oh, Hans, like stuff like that. It's just. As SpongeBob fans, at least for anybody that has grew up with an episode like that, I, I like to think that there are moments like um, putting on the gloves and Hans and the lollipop, or not even just in this episode, but other ones that are just ingrained in your mind when certain moments in your life happen. I'd like to think that that happens, uh, and I'm not the only one here. Uh, but thank you for listening to the I'm Ready a SpongePod Squarecast. I appreciate. Uh, all of the love that's been sent, uh, follow us on Instagram at SpongeBob podcast, uh, find us on Facebook, find us on YouTube, uh, twitch.tv slash SpongeBob podcast. I'm going to go back to regularly streaming, um, right when probably right after October, right when the, the fall season hits, um, 
and uh, and yeah, pay attention to our YouTube channel. More video only content is going to be released there. For anybody who'd like to help out, my uh, my G4 audition video is still live on YouTube. It's still up on G4's Reddit. If you have a Reddit account, by all means, please go to G4 TV's subreddit. Find my audition video, uh, like it up, leave me a nice comment, tell them that you're, uh, tell them that you came here because of the podcast. All of that helps. Uh, and trust me, if that kind of work comes my way, if I'm ended up working at G4, uh, this podcast is still my number one thing to work on. So don't think that if uh, if I were to ever get something like that, I would leave the ready crew behind. So have a great week, and we'll see you here next week. Oh!